Welcome, everyone. It's glad to have you. Uh, to get a garden that really looks good year round, it takes a little planning. The key steps are to plan the garden, put in plants that give structure to the garden, and then fill it up with plants that have great foliage and great flowers. There will always be a high season in your garden and a low season in your garden, but it never should look completely devoid of color. Remember that when your eye picks up a pattern in your garden, whether it's color, size, shape, or texture, then suddenly everything looks intentional. A useful help is to use a consistent color palette for the paths, such as gray pavers or gravel. These things provide calm and a little control, and they help keep the plants from taking over, at least visually. Ten Minute University, oops, sorry. Ten Minute University is a program of Clackamas County Master Garden Association, offered in collaboration with and in support of Oregon State Extension Master Gardener Program. The 10 Minute University trademark provides essential gardening information for the home gardener. Oregon State University owns the trademark and Clackamas County Master Gardeners develop and manage the program. At our website, you will find handouts, videos, classes, and workshops. Our program is volunteer led and we are supported by OSU faculty to ensure the quality of our content. Let's Grow Together is the theme of 10 Minute University's 2023 online seminars. This is our schedule at a glance. For more information or to register for classes, please visit cmastergardeners.org. Thank you for making us part of your gardening journey. I think this idea is often lost in design talks about color in the garden, but color is essential to life, pollination, ripening, and other biological processes. These are some landscape terms I'll be talking about today. Color, size, shape, and texture. Texture refers to foliage, it's bold, spiky, smooth, feathery, lacy, velvety, prickly. Tapestry means the art of placing plants in a pleasing combination. Triangles in the garden. This is how to place plants and art. And I'll talk about this throughout the presentation. So if things don't look good now, they never will. So start with a clear out, decide what needs to stay and what you want to dig up and pass on. View your garden from different perspective, whether it's a season, color choices, or focusing on an art object. One way to do this is to walk through your garden one way and then turn around and walk through it backwards. And you'll see things that you weren't necessarily aware of. This is how I do garden tours, and it's amazing what I see that I didn't see the first time. Ignore a season if you're not home, home or you don't want to go outside like winter. Planting for a year-round color garden comes with responsibility, knowing the elements, whether it's like rain, wind, rain, temperature, can dramatically impact your garden. Knowing your local weather is patterns is a good start to making sure your all your hard work pays off all year round. Flowers are mostly ephemeral in your garden, so foliage becomes important. Contrast colors bring excitement to your garden. Some of my favorites are purple and orange yellow and red, purple and lime green. Three to five plants brings a mass to your garden. You don't want the polka dot look. 
where you have one of everything all through your garden. Vanessa Nagel is a Portland landscape designer and she wrote a book called Understanding Garden Design. And I'm simplifying what she says. In simple terms, she uses a sentence to, to design a, a portion of the garden. The exclamation point brings your eye to the area. That could be a species plant, an art object, a super color. Then you fill in with the nouns. These are the shrubs that give the background to the exclamation point. Then you add the adverbs and the adjectives in the mid to lower range in your garden to finish the design. Create surprises with garden art, arbors, special, uh, specimen plants. Foliage gives the opportunity to play with color, size, texture, and shape, and height all at the same time. And foliage comes in shades of green, blue, purple, black, white, red, gold, etc. Look at this picture. You can see all those colors, and yet there's not a picture, there's not a flower. Your eye sees color, and it doesn't care if it's a leaf or a flower. Many uh, perennials have a two to six week heyday of high bloom, and then retreat into foliage. So do a little research and choose the foliage and the flowers that you like. Colors, shapes, sizes, and texture, all in this picture. This creates tapestry. So on the left, we have the gray burgundy of the astilbe. We have the round, shiny leaf of the burgina, which has been eaten by a bug. We have the purple of the oxalis. This is a heuchera, so it's golden with red purple veining. Down here is that variegated um, Alt Solomon seal. Now I'm going to start talking about triangles so you can see how it works. So the first triangle is the gray burgundy of the stilby, the oxalis purple, and the veining in the heuchera. So that becomes your triangle. Another triangle, maybe not as strong, would be this estrancha down here with the pink blossoms. And when it's in bloom, the whole plant is pink. So it would be the pink, the astilbe, and the oxalis. That's the triangles. We're gonna start the seasons now, start with spring. Spring comes in short, long, Early, and then it has three phases, early, mid, and late. And you can have plants that look good in each one. Early spring is chilly with erratic weather patterns. So look for tough early bloomers, such as hellebores, witch hazel, snowdrops. In mid to late spring, you'll notice lilacs, peonies, and many others that come into bloom. Spring is known for pastel colors. They, all the colors blend together so well. And spring is the time to plant, visit nurseries, and get excited about your garden again after winter. Remember the advice, right plant, right place. It pays to do your research when purchasing plants. It, it's an investment in your garden. Throughout the presentation, we are gonna see three gardens, usually from the same perspective all through the year. So this is a spring garden that Sherry has created. So you have the bur light burgundy of the Japanese lace leaf maple, the pink of the um, flowering cherry. But look at the layering. She has tall, middle, and low. When you layer, then you give structure and substance to your garden. This is the moon bridge at the Japanese gardens. 
They do it so well. So there are two triangles in this photo. You have the pink of the azalea. The rhodi is just about blooming and it has pink red blooms. And then you have the burgundy of the lace leaf maple. There's your triangle. See how it provides a framework for this whole garden. There's a second triangle. You have the dark brown of the tree trunk, the dark brown of the bridge, and the dark water. So you can have an inanimate object like the bridge and it still counts as a color. Of all the camellias, the family in the Nuccio, Nuccio series are my favorite. So this is Nuccio's pearl and look how soft it is. It, all the Nuccio's are multi-petaled and they have a real soft appearance. This uh, flowers in March, it's zone seven and in the Northwest we are both basically zone seven and zone eight. It gets eight to eight feet tall and four feet wide in about seven years. Big fragrance, that comes with spring. And usually it's Daphne that you smell first, it's so wonderful. But also common lilacs, peonies and hyacinths have a scent also. And then the color palette, such as pink, lavender and white are classic spring look. These colors are soft and easy to mix and match. And the reason is, they have the same intensity or saturation. In this garden of Leah's, see, this was pretty flat when they, when they moved in. Then she added the rocks, the stairs, the waterfall, and all these trees. So the trees and shrubs provide overall structure and for you to have a good looking design in your garden. And under the deciduous trees, you can plant annuals, perennials, or bulbs. So when they come up in the spring, they get the kind spring sun. And then as the trees leaf out, then you get, and you get the harsh summer sun, the leaves now protect all those uh, bulbs underneath the tree. This is the April garden. Look how much is coming up. All the perennials are starting to come up and bring in a lot of color. So bulbs uh, provide a series of flowers. Buy bulbs in bulk to provide a, a good display. They look best when you have in masses or in swaths. And so when you buy them, just throw them out into your garden and plant them where they lay. That makes it look like mother nature did it. So common spring combinations are daffodils, brunera, tulips, peony, Japanese iris, peonies, penstemon. So you could have snowdrops in February, crocus in March, tulips in April, and alliums in May. This Hamamelis gelina, it's a witch hazel, is my favorite, and I've used it in a lot of plants' gardens. The flower comes out first, and it's an orange bronze look, and then it leaves out later. But think of that orange bronze look against the rainy gray sky. It'll look spectacular. This uh, lilac sensation I like because each petal is outlined in white. So it gives the lilac a lot more interest. And Erica Meyertown Ruby has such cool flowers because that's that hot fuchsia and then the black. And pansies are the workout horse in almost every season. In this photo, we, the plants are candelabra primroses, and the lime green plant is Acamilla mollus, and the common name is ladies' mantle. So there are two 
different triangles in this one. The first one is the candelabra, the candelabra, and the ribes, red flower and current back here. The second triangle, you take this primrose, which is called Vial's primrose, V-I-A-L, it's my favorite. It's sometimes it's called the lipstick primrose. So look at that color. So you know, this is the triangle. This one, this candelabra, and this pale pink candelabra down here. Oh, can you ever, ever have too many containers? Not really. Not if you keep the colors within the confined palette. So that means if you have containers in your front yard, they will all, maybe they're all shades of red. And on your side garden, maybe they're all shades of turquoise. So as long as within the area that you can see, all the containers are the same, within the same palette, it'll go together. When I do uh, containers for clients, I try to use charcoal or black because those two are the absence of color. And so anything you put in the container is just gonna shine. These three containers go well together because they all have a touch of bronze. That's the common element. Look at the strength of turquoise in this container. This is a purple verbena. And the reason it works with the turquoise is because the color saturation or intensity is the same. If you had a really soft yellow plant in here or a soft pink in patience, it might get lost because the turquoise color is so strong. This is my uh, friend's red flyer wagon. Her daughter's in her 40s now and doesn't need the wagon. So Vicki drilled holes in the wagon, spray painted it with red rust-oleum paint and then put in potting soil. And then she put in a combination of pansies and bio biolus. In this presentation, at the end of each season, I'm going to give a container for each month. And they're all by Portland Nursery. I called the marketing director at Portland Nursery and asked if I could have permission to do monthly containers in this presentation. And he said, yes. So if you go to Portland Nursery and then to monthly containers, you can look up March and they might be eight or 11 different designs that you can follow. The neat thing is after you see the picture, then that the plant list is given. So you can go out to the nursery and recreate each one that you like. So in March, you have the hellebore pink frost. And then this is an anemone called Mona Lisa. Don't they go well together? This is a Carex called uh, Evergold. This is April's container. This is a geranium called Mrs. Pollock and it has red uh, scarlet flowers, but we don't care because it's the leaves that we enjoy. So look at the colors in the heugra. Then up here is the orange ranunculus and the red primrose. That's your triangle. And then it's grounded by this pink formium. Over here, we have Osteosperum, the single white imperial. And it's the star of the show. It's cool because each of those little petals looks like a spoon. But up here, you have the Delphinium, guardian blue. And down here, you have two Lithodora, called heavenly blue. But see how they form a triangle and they center the, the osteospernum. Now in summer. Summer, gar summer gardening can have its challenges because your plants dry out, you've got weeding, you have excessive sun, you have a lot of maintenance. But you also get to be outside and enjoy your garden. Look at the difference Summer is known for its hot palette, its primary colors, red, orange, yellow. Those are summer colors. Where spring is pastel colors, summer is primary colors. So 
So this is Sherry's garden in summer. She, look how soft it's all getting up with the, all the leaf trees and shrubs leafing out. This garden is several acres big and she uses her lawn as garden paths. Because the yard, the garden is so big, she uses all her annuals in either hanging baskets or containers. When you plant perennials and shrubs, spread them out, interweaving them with existing plants to create that tapestry effect. Remember tapestry is the art of placing plants in a pleasing manner. By layering your garden as tall, middle, low, you can create a rich, full look. This is the Japanese garden in the summer. Look how soft this is now with that summer sun. Green is the color of peace, harmony, and renewal. Perfect for the Japanese garden. Here the triangles are the tree trunk, brown, the bridge, brown, water, muddy, muddy brown. So mud is a color too. In this photo, look how the hot colors of the orange container and the really hot orange burgundy of the barberry bring your eyes right to this design in her garden. The lime green of these plants provide a buffer between the hot colors. So your eyes has a mini place to rest before looking at all those hot primary colors. This is a crocosmia called Lucifer. It's kind of red orange and it's surrounded by these um, black eyed Susans. So that's that red, yellow, red, orange combination. Okay, here the triangle is crocosmia, red bird bath, way across the way, two more red bird baths. So the triangles can be quite large. And by have, being the triangle on the other side, it combines the whole garden bed together. So you have primary colors in sun, pastels and shade. Roses, of course, there are roses for everyone, every garden, fragrant, non-fragrant, brilliant colors. This crab spider on the rose is an interesting little guy. He nestles inside the petals of the rose to snare bees and leaf hoppers. So the crab spider is actually a beneficial predator and it rids the roses of leaf hoppers, which can eat the leaves. With climate change, it's important to recognize that ladybugs, spiders, and dragonflies act as natural predators for pests in your garden like aphids, caterpillars, and stem borers. I was on a garden tour several years ago, and this garden just is exquisite. And this one, this one photo was so perfect. This is a shade garden. And I'm sure the gardener, when she designed this with a big rock and a water feature, then she planted this hardy geranium called Roseanne to soften the rock and the water feature. Roseanne is one of those plants that doesn't respect boundaries. So she decided not to stay in this little section, but to climb up into this hydrangea paniculata. But look how that combination looks so wonderful. This is another section of her garden. And look at the contrast in color and texture between the barberry admiration and the cypress whipcord. So this barberry gets about three by three feet. What very well mannered, full sun. But each of the burgundy leaves is outlined in lime green. It's wonderful. And that lime green picks up the light green color of the whipcord. And then you have this blue green succulents down here. This is a great tapestry because of the different shapes and textures of the foliage. 
And another part of this garden, there's an all green color palette, but the sizes, shapes, and textures all contribute to wonderful calm tapestry. But what brings your eye to this photo is that blue panel. And then you have the blue, green, gray urn and the cement lantern. So that's your triangle of art. And then there's a dry stream riverbed running along this border. This is my garden in summer. When I was uh, creating this garden, I put in these agasashi called Apache Summer. And I realized that in my garden, apricot is my favorite color. And if I had my druthers, if I don't think about it, all my flowers would be apricot, all my foliage would be burgundy, and all my foliage would be variegated. So I have to really work with myself so that my garden has interests other than the color apricot. But anyway, so agastache here, agastache here. And by staggering these two colors, you draw your eye down the path. Remember this uh, pink phlox, because we'll talk about it later. I use silver and white impatience to line my garden paths, again, to lead my eye down the path. Look at the strength of colors in the summer garden, from the echinacea, the golden orange of the carex. This is a rose called, frankly, scarlet. The chrysanthemums. Then this is a clematis from the Rogers and Clematis Garden in West Lynn, and it's purple with fuchsia. Ooh, cool. This is the radio flyer in summer. So right in the middle is this petunia right in here. It's waiting for another flush of bloom. So she has lime green potato vine. There's a purple salvia here. And then she's picked up the lime green in this coleus. Vicki lets her garden, her grass go dormant in the summer because she'd rather use her watering in her beds. And because of the coleus, and the wagon gets to travel throughout her garden. So in the morning, the wagon is over here. And then as the summer sun beats in the west, then Vicki pulls the wagon into a part shade, part sun area. So the wagon gets to travel all over the backyard and have an adventure. The yellow in this June container brings your eye right to this container. This is a shade garden, part sun, part shade. This is a fuchsia called Gartenmeister. It's my favorite and I buy it every year. It's an annual in our climate. This fluffy stuff is called uh, annual for us. It's a euphorbia, breathless blush. But look at August container. You have the yellow and orange of the mums. And then you have the sedum angelina. The other triangle is this cabbage called tall bicolor. Then it has sedums, Cape Blanco. I have this in my garden and the leaves kind of form a cup. It's really a pretty one. That soft gray. Now we're into fall. The light is softer. The temperatures are lower. Hopefully our rain is back and plants are happier and you can have a warmer color palette. Fall is my favorite time. So late season bloomers can bring excitement to your fall garden in addition to the fall leaves, which count as a color. So now Sherry's lace leaf maple is a brilliant red orange. It picks up the red over in this plant here. Trees and shrubs in golden orange and red tones for autumn look wonderful. Look for long, long blooming plants like hibiscus or hardy mallow, asters, dahlias, grasses, start putting kale and cabbage out. Trees that hold on to their fruit, such as Korean dogwood with those orange pods and persimmon add interest to the late fall and early winter garden. 
This is a, a, the reverse of the moon bridge that we've seen. So this is a divine maple. Look at that warm color. And this is that lace leaf maple that we've seen in the two previous seasons. Isn't that lovely? Look how cool the bark, that brown is, of the twigs. The warmth of color in fall. So Cotinus grace is the common name is smoke bush in Leah's garden. So look how you have kind of a soft blue, the red orange, the yellow over here. Lots of stuff is going on in a fall November garden. So the Cotinus has bright red leaves in the spring, dark red, in almost a burgundy in the summer, and then in fall, red, orange, and gold. It's called a smoke bush because the flowers look like wisps of smoke. So there are trees with amazing leaf color, great bark, and shapes like Japanese maples, paper bark maple, and stewardia. This is my favorite paper uh, maple. It's called paper, paper bark maple. So it has a really open canopy and now nice round shape. The green leaves in spring and summer turn this wonderful scarlet orange in the fall. And then it becomes, as it ages, you get this defoliation of the bark. So it's really a four season tree. Once the leaves are gone, you get to look at this bark, which is just amazing. It gets about 25 feet tall by 20 feet. This is another great tree with great bark, Stewardia. So the leaves come out in bronzy purple in the spring, then go to dark green in summer. And in summer, these camellia-like flowers come out. And then the leaves turn that red orange in the fall. And once the diameter of the trunk gets about three inches, then it starts defoliating too. It gets about 40 feet tall and 20 feet wide. The Caryopteris has really pretty gray-green leaves, lightly scented, but these amazing purple-blue flowers. It, it uh, flowers late. So it starts in late summer and goes right up until late fall. Sedum almond joy um, blooms in the fall too. So it's an herbaceous plant. And then it comes up and it has these soft green succulent leaves and then burst into bloom. The dahlias are still going great. And then your autumn crocus comes up too. This is Shalom Oblica, and it's also called the turtle head plant because the flowers look like turtle heads. It's herbaceous. Mine is up about two feet now. It's the reason, one of the reasons I like it is because it has these really cut leaves, and I like the shape of the flowers. Pink is not one of my favorite colors. So I had to think of what can I put in my garden that reflects the pink so I can have my triangle. So I chose Panicum Shenandoah. It's a great grass. It's herbaceous. It's deciduous. So the new you cut it down in the fall, and then the new growth in spring comes up green with red tips. Then turns mostly red during the season, and in the summer it has little tiny pinky red flowers. So this is on one side of my patio to the other side, and then remember that fox from my summer garden. That's my triangle. Rebecca Goldstone is the standard for Black Eyed Susans. They're making, they're hybridizing so many cool Rebecca's now in bronzies, different yellows, oranges. They're all great. I bought one called Little Henry because I thought the name was cute. And I planted it behind my Autumn Joy Sedum. Well, Little Henry was not little. He was five feet. 
So this is why it pays to read the tag on your plants. They give you so much information. And you see the four frogs waiting for their next meal. So the red flyer in fall, our fall lasted almost into, de into December, was very late. So it was hard to get a, a winter wagon going. So she put gourds in, yay. <laughs> So there's a black eyed Susan. This is a container that I actually made for myself last fall. I have a red container this color. So it has apricot pansies. So of course I liked it. This is the triangle. This is a huber called mahogany. And the leaves look like leather. It's really cool. There's another triangle, pansy, pansy, and a plant called croprosma. It gets about uh, five by three. It's kind of delicate here because it's a zone nine, but in the fall, it has apricot green and yellow leaves. It's, it's wonderful. It doesn't flower, it's just got great foliage. In winter, the colors are very muted, but plants that bloom in the winter give a burst of color in the midst of all those rainy gray days but you can have the starkness and beauty of the deciduous trees and shrubs so sherry took this picture on purpose in black and white our winter garden is about light as much as it is about plants says adrian bloom who's a horticulturist and a garden designer in england and he's one of my favorite writers so you place evergreen plants for structure and interest. The twigs and the branches build a frame to hold the garden together. It's the combination of evergreen trees and deciduous trees and shrubs that make your garden. Black and white photos are often suggested by garden design books because you're looking at the structure. You aren't deceived by the color. Color is an emotion. And when you take away color, then you see the garden as it truly is. And then sight lines are exposed. So maybe looking around your garden, you can see where you need something round or something oblong, or if it's too bushy, maybe you could create a path through it. There are often designers that say, when you start your garden, if you're lucky enough to start from scratch, you build your winter garden first because that makes you put in the structure. It's too easy in spring and summer to go for the pretty things <laughs> and then think, rats, now where am I gonna put the tree? This is the moon bridge in the Japanese garden. Look how much evergreen material they use. Here's that fine maple. So you have the tweet, the branches here, the bark here, and our famous bridge. Landscape structures such as fences, pergolas, and garden sheds can add a dose of visual thrill to your, to your yard. This is uh, actually a color picture, but it looks black and white. Here's a little bit of green and then the waterfall drips and gives us it's a very soothing sound. Notice the blue doors on the shed. And look at the structure of the tree branches and they look so neat with frost on them. That structure is so important in a winter garden. So now look at the door on the blue shed, it's glowing. And it really helps to have a wonderful sunrise. So Leah and her husband went uh, through discussions to decide what color to paint the doors on the shed. They went through many red, green, yellow, nothing was quite right until blue. We like blue. And then they decided, they well, they had to go through five colors of blue before they found the right 
blue. And then you get a sunrise to go with it. It's lovely. This looks like marshmallow cream. And again, the blue doors stand out. So this is such a cool conifer. It gets to maturity about two feet high, three feet, three feet in width. But look at those cones. It's a spreading. It will get bigger with age. It's so four, takes sun, partial shade. Look at the color on the um, cones. And then look how it picks up the color of the needles on the branch. It's a beautiful tree. Sure. Batsia japonica murakumo nishiki means gathering clouds, brocade. It's red, excuse me, gold and green with deep cut leaves. And it's so hard in a winter garden to find big leaves. I have one called spider that's green and white variegated. They get about five by five. They have flowers like this, and I leave mine on until November about, until they look like straw. They take part sun, part shade. Here's some more of the Nuccio family. Look at that saturated red. The leaves are matte. Matte leaves absorb light. Shiny leaves reflect light. This blooms late winter to mid spring. It's sown eight. It can get quite big with age. This is my favorite, Nuccio's gem. The flowers, it blooms in winter. And the flowers to me look like doves or clouds. It's so lovely. Zone seven, it blooms in winter. And the leaves are shiny. So they reflect light. The Northwest Garden Nursery is owned by Eddie, excuse me, Ernie and Marietta O'Byrne, and they've hybridized hellebores. So I called Marietta and asked if I could use these pictures in my presentation. She said, sure. Look at those colors. Aren't they amazing? And the winter jewel hellebores bloom late winter, early spring. They're fabulous in those early spring days when nothing much else is going on. They're evergreen. Um, the O'Burns are the ones that hybridized the hellebore uh, flowers to face up. So that you can see them. The traditional hellebores all face down. Mahonia soft caress is one of my favorite plants. Mahonia is Oregon grape, and you can tell by the yellow flowers. The foliage is so soft. It's like a fern or bamboo. Nothing goes wrong with it. It's three by three and a half high and wide. It's zone seven to nine, perfect in our climate. Nothing goes wrong with it. I've grown it in containers, but it's actually happier in the ground. The more sun it gets, the more chance you'll have of those blossoms. This is my new favorite, Semper Vivum. Semper Vivum means in Latin, always living. So they were kind of expensive because they're kind of new. So I found a nursery that, that had three pups that I bought and I put them in a bird bath that, no longer, that leaked. I could no longer use it as a bird bath and I made it my sedum garden. And they made it through the last year, through all the ice and snow, snow and buckets of rain. It's an evergreen Semper Vivum. It's fabulous. So red twig dogwood also comes in yellow twig dogwood. And the way that you grow it, you in the spring, you cut it off close to the base because the color comes from new growth. And the, the plant is, very ordinary looking during the year, but in winter, these yellow and uh, red twigs just shine. They're outstanding in a garden. 
This is Calicarpa profusion, which is the standard. So it's a deciduous plant. The leaves come out, they're green. It has purple pink flowers in the spring, insignificant. But all those flowers form seed heads that become this violet purple. And when the leaves fall off in the fall, you have this shrub with these amazing berries on them. The birds love them, so you have to look quick. This is Sarcococa, and I love this plant. It's a shiny leaves, nothing goes wrong. It blooms for mine. They bloom in de between December and February, depending on how hard the winter is. The, the flowers are so small that you see it's the scent of almost Daphne. So you know the scent is coming from somewhere, but you don't necessarily know where it is. When the seed flowers are done, then the seed is a black blue uh, berry. When the berry falls down to the ground, you get a new plant. So it's kind of important to get those up quickly. Ultimately, you're designing a winter garden based on simplicity, elegance, and smart design. In this one photo, we have a blue plant, but this is the plant I want to talk about, Liburdia. And in between is that Meyertown Ruby, Erica. So this is an evergreen, it's not a grass, it's the because the leaves are really stiff. And in the spring, a stalk comes up with a white flower. And when the white flower is done, it has a yellow berry. It gets about 18 inches high and 24 inches wide. And it likes the Pacific Northwest. So look at these layers. Here you have witch hazel, pallida. Underneath is an, a grass called a chorus ogon. If you see Ogon in the name of a plant, it usually means yellow. Then we have Meyertown Ruby, but back here is the plant, plant I want to show you. This is also a cornice, and it's called Midwinter Fire. So again, this is one that you would cut down to the ground in spring, and then it will, grows up. And so it goes yellow, orangey, red, red. It looks like a bonfire. And it's really impactful when you have it growing like five to seven together. I've seen this in um, public gardens and it's spectacular. It gets about five feet tall and six foot wide. It zones five to seven. So it's perfect in our area. This is the radio flyer in December, December before winter came. Our fall was so late. So I said, Vicki, this is not quite what I wanted. And she said, but Laura, I put in a white cyclamen. Yay. Okay, now that's the winter wagon. In December, we have a viburnum called compacta. It's three by three. So when you use shrubs in your container, some point you're going to get to move them to your garden. But for a December container, you can have pine cones, white cyclamen, red twig dogwood. You've got a, a winter container, a holiday container. This is a hellebore called cinnamon snow. And it's in back of it is a carex grass called sparkler. It's, it's a wonderful combination. This is a, a smaller sarcococca. It sarcococca amylus. It gets two feet by three feet. This is a dianthus called Super Trooper, velvet and white. I've never seen it in a nursery, but boy, if I found it, I would use it. So plants look great on their own, but when they're matched with a piece of art, the whole area becomes a piece of art. So choose a style, whether it's rustic, architectural, or glass, it all adds charm. What you're doing is you're making a moment and moments pull you through a garden, which then becomes a journey 
which then becomes an event rather than just a collection of plants putting together. Moments let you stop and enjoy the scene before moving on. This is Mike from Mike Darcy's garden. Mike Darcy is a writer in Portland and is a media, does radio shows. So these are canna lilies, yay, banana, yay. But what makes this whole scene so wonderful is this two panel fence. And look how the sun shines, shines through the glass and has all the shadowing on the canna leaves. So the addition of the fence makes this whole combination wonderful. So you can have a beautiful, unique garden that can be enjoyed not just for the season, but for your lifetime. Plant for the best condition in your garden, right plant, right place. If a plant doesn't serve its purpose, Move it, reuse it, compost it. It's a nursery opportunity. So this is a clematis called Taiga in my garden. And the flowers on this are really outstanding. They're purple and lime, two of my favorite colors. And it almost, it goes through this series of growth from just budding out to budding out to an old, it almost looks like a passion flower. It gets about eight feet tall, so it's a smaller clematis. So I planted it in a tutor that encaged it, black wrought iron. And my idea was that it would grow up and then water fall down. But Taika had different thoughts. She's like a uh, hardy geranium Roxanne, would go el rather go elsewhere. So in front of this Taika, I have a dwarf oak leaf hydrangea uh, with white panicle flowers. And Taiga is so happy weaving herself through that. So I get that white and purple look. And by midsummer, I am so tired of pushing her back into the tour. I say, okay, fine. Thank you for coming. That was spectacular. I just love seeing all those beautiful, beautiful pictures and color combinations and some great ideas. I do have uh, one question that I'd like to go through. Um, right at the beginning, one of the attendees asked, so is it challenging to get year round color, texture, all of that, while keeping in mind that you've got pets and you have to worry about toxicity and what about pollinators birds bees that kind of stuff does the color mm. automatically draw those yes creatures so is that the question does that's the question that's a multi-part question i should have broken it up i'm sorry so color does does draw the pollinators to do all those biological processes, processes. Is that the answer? Uh, <laughs> that's part of the answer. I think that also that just because a flower is colorful doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be beneficial for bees, pollinators, that kind of thing. They have things that they prefer and, um, but there are links at OSU that say, these are the, these are the flowers that, the pollinators prefer. But what about, do you think about like toxicity when you're planning, you know, for pets and things like that? Or, you know, there's just a whole range of things to think about when you're, when you're planning all of that. Um, right. And that's why you have to do your research. It's also why you need to read your plant tags, because you're going to get most of the information there. I'm hesitant to recommend or, or differentiate between what plants are toxic and what aren't, because there are so many, and each one has different toxicity to different things. Yeah. You prefer that each one does their own research on that. And I think that's a that's a really good point, not only in the toxicity um, and 
um, when you were talking about, I think you said little Henry that you thought was going to be a little small plant and that it's not. Reading the plant tags is really, really important because you can look at something at the nursery and go, oh, that's adorable. And then get a surprise later on in the year. Our neighbor is 30, well, for yeah. many decades. And I just passed right over that. <laughs> that little. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, I, we don't have any more open questions. So thank you so much. And I'd like to remind everybody that the, you will get a link within two days to this recorded webinar. So you can go over it, take a look at the pictures and again, and you will also get a link to the um, featured plants, both in the containers and in the gardens. If you come up with a question that you haven't been able to think of quickly enough, you can always send it to the 10 Minute University uh, master, the Master Gardener website, and um, it, the link will be in your confirmation letter, and we will be happy to answer that for you at a later time. So thank you so much for coming, and we will see you hopefully next week when we learned about uh, year-round vegetables. Take care. Have a lovely day in this beautiful sunshine. <laughs>